Have you noticed that our world is really messed up? You, have, you, have you seen anything like that? Is that like an understatement? To say that our world is upside down, is that pretty obvious? Is, 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 that, is that the understatement of the world? What is one thing? No, 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 let me ask you differently. What is the one thing that would fix it all? What is the one? Th- Here's our world completely messed up. And some of you, I think, are like me. And you're thinking we have passed the point of no return. Some of you might be like me and thinking there's no hope. It's gone. There's no turning this baby back. It's all the way down the road and it's never going to be recovered. Let me ask you a question. Is there something that could change that? Is there something strong enough that could turn the tides of our society back in the right direction? You know something strong enough? Where would it have to start with these people? Where would it have to start with our nation? Where would it have to start with our community and with our culture? Would it not have to start with their hearts? Would we not have to have something that could reach into their hearts and change the way they think, change what they want, change where they're going? This morning I want us to think about some heart alterations that can be made. Some heart altering. We're going to look at some truths and some facts this morning. But I want us to say, what, what could change people's hearts? What could alter somebody's hearts? Is it not the cross of Jesus Christ? We're emphasizing this year being at His cross. And this month talking about at His cross, I find truth. There are some truths that, that if, we will, if we'll go back to the cross and see them and find them and put them in our hearts, brother and sister in Christ, it'll change us. Before we can change the world, we've got to change us first. Before the hearts of the world can be changed, we've got to make sure our hearts are right. So I'm going to challenge you today. I'm going to challenge you to look inside your heart. Is there anything we talk about today where you need a heart alteration? Let me ask you to do something as we begin. You might close your eyes to imagine this. I want you to go back and in your imagination, I want you to look at Jesus hanging on the cross. Close your eyes and think about Jesus hanging there on that cross. You see him? I want you to look at that crown of thorns that's on his head. I want you to look at that blood that's running down from that crown of thorns. I want you to look in Jesus' eyes. I want you to look at Jesus' body that has been battered and bruised. I want you to look at his body that has been torn to shreds by the scourging. I want you to look at those nails that have been driven into his hands and that nail that was driven into his feet. I want you to see him hanging there, not fully clothed, but mostly unclothed clothed in all humility and humiliation. And as you look at him, I want to ask you this question. What color is Jesus? Let me ask it this way. What's Jesus' skin color? What color is his skin? Does that matter? As you're looking at Jesus hanging on that cross, does it matter to you what color His skin is? The pictures that people have drawn of Jesus, the movies that we have of Jesus, of this white guy, not it. And if you're offended by the idea 
that it might not be a white guy hanging on that cross. You know what? It doesn't matter, does it? Does it matter to you what color Jesus was? If Jesus wasn't the color you thought he was, would that bother you? Would it change your opinion of him? Would it change the way that you look at him as your Savior? You know, you look at Jesus and everything I, that we just went through and imagining what he was on the cross, that was the last thing that mattered to you. Why does it matter so much today to everybody else? Here's the first thing I want us to look at this morning. You want to change your heart this morning? I want us to look at Jesus and look at His unprejudiced, one-colored blood. Whatever color Jesus was, His blood was the same color as yours. The blood running down from Jesus' head and His hands and His feet and every open wound in His body was the same color as your blood, is the same color as everybody else's blood in this world. What difference does it make what color He was? What difference does it make what color anybody is? I want you to think about that. Jesus shed His blood. His blood for everybody of every race. Jesus shed His blood for every colorless soul. What color is your soul? I didn't ask you what color you are. I didn't ask you what color your body is. What color is your soul? It doesn't have a color. The color of your soul is the same color as everybody else's soul who's ever lived on this earth. And Jesus shed His blood for every single one of them. In Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9, there's a song that they're singing in heaven. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9, they sang a new song saying to Jesus, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seal. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God. You have redeemed us to God by your blood. Jesus, who did you redeem to God? Look at it at the end of verse 9. You have redeemed to God by your blood out of every tribe and every tongue and every people and every nation. It doesn't matter where they're from and what they look like. Jesus' blood was shed for them. Do we believe that? Do we understand that? When we look at the cross of Jesus, do we see an unprejudiced, one colored blood being shed for all of mankind alike? In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14 and 15, he died for all. Who does that include? That includes everybody. Jesus does not show partiality, he is not prejudiced. He does not show, he, he is not a respecter of persons. I want you to think about that. When Jesus went to the cross, did he only die for the people that he liked? Did he only die for the people that were the same color as him? Or did Jesus look and die for everyone of every color? Does Jesus look down and look at every person the same? For some reason, we have allowed, and we weren't born this way, we have allowed our environment, our culture, to teach us how to look at different people different ways. We weren't born that way. That's not the way God made us. That's the way the world's tried to make us. But Jesus looks down, and He sees every single person the same. And He could care less what color you are. He could care less. He could care less what color I am. That's not what matters to the Son of God. If that's not what matters to Him, why does it matter so much to us? Is our world messed up? Yeah. And you know what? Sometimes we're a part of that. Sometimes we are a part of that. And I say we in the collective sense of it doesn't matter what race, what ethnicity, what color we are, we collectively have been a part of that problem. Brother and sister in Christ, it's time for us to draw a line and say, I'm done with that. 
Our society may not ever draw that line and say they're done with that. In fact, there are people around us who are feeding on that. Who are feeding on that division. Who are feeding on dividing us based upon what do we need to do. As a Christian, I need to make up my mind. I'm not going to go down that road anymore. I'm not going to be baited into those racially charged conversations anymore. I'm not going to be baited into that. I'm not going to be baited into those racially charged situations where somebody draws me in and, oh, no, 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 I'm not going to be a part of that anymore. I'm not going to be a part of those posts on social media where I start sharing these things because I, 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 think, I think they agree with where I am in my, in, in my ethnicity and in my skin color. I, I, I'm, a, I, I'm, I'm sad to say that there are some of my brothers and sisters in Christ that I have unfollowed on Facebook because it used to be that they would post positive, uplifting, Bible-based, church things, church activities. Here's what my children are doing. Here's a Bible verse for the day. They would post uplifting and encouraging things that would make my day, and now all of a sudden, the last few months, you know what they're posting? It's all about race. It's all about what color this person is and what color that person is and why that makes a difference. Guess what? It doesn't make a difference. Jesus died for every single one of them. The color of your skin is not who you are. We may come back in some other lesson and talk about this. But the color of your skin, that's not who you are. It's not your identity. Who you are is inside that skin. How many of you drove a car or rode in a car to come here today? Come on, more than four of you. Give me a break. I see them out there. You drove in a car. You rode in a car to get here today. I've got a silver car and I've got a red car. Does that mean I'm red? Does that mean I'm silver? No, duh, David, that's just a car. And you're just inside of that car. Yeah, that's it. That's just a car. And I'm inside of that car. This is just a rough looking car. This is, this is just a shell. That's what the Bible says. This is just a tent. This is just a vessel. It means nothing. Who I am is inside the body. What my body looks like, guess what? What my body looks like doesn't matter. What I look like to God spiritually is what matters. Brother, sister in Christ, I'm begging you. Let us be the ones who help turn that tide. Let us be the ones who look inside and be the ones who say, I am a Christian first. I, I, I'm not black or white first. Uh-uh. I'm not male or female first. Nope, doesn't matter. I am a Christian first. And that alone will determine how I speak, who I speak to, how I live, how I behave, what I post, what I share. I'm a Christian first. Would Jesus post this? Would Jesus agree with this? Would Jesus want me to shout out to the world, here's what I think about this? Or would Jesus want me to be focused on being a Christian first? Boy, there's a lot more we could say about this subject. But when we look at the cross, what do we see? Unprejudiced, one colored blood. I'm not talking to just one group of us in here. I'm talking to every single one of us. It starts with us. I look at the cross and not only see His blood. I look at the cross of Jesus and it will alter my heart because I see His unflinching, hate-resisting love. We live in a world that is filling up faster and faster with hate. Everywhere around us, it seems... That people are just being engulfed by hate. And people are, are, are just shouting out hate. And, and you can't turn on the television. You can't watch a TV show, let alone the news. You know when you watch the news, it's just going to be H-A-T-E. It's just going to be hate all over. You can't watch TV today without there being something with, with 
We're, it's all around us. But the answer to hate, look at the cross of Jesus. The answer to hate is not hate. Somebody says, well, I'll fix that. I'll just show them and I'll, I'll, I'll. is that going to work? The answer to hate is not hate. The answer to hate is not more hate. Well, I'll just pile it on. I'll just give it some more. Hate breeds hate. The more you feed it, the bigger it becomes. Is that where I need to be as a Christian? Do I need to just get sucked right in on that to that hate, to that hate level? Do I need to be seen? Remember what I am first? I'm a Christian first. Well, what does that mean? I look at the cross of Jesus. Did Jesus respond to hate with hate? Jesus responded to hate with love. That's the answer. If the question is hate, the answer is love. That's what God calls upon us as Christians to respond with. In Romans chapter 12, repay no one evil for evil. Read that verse again. Repay no one evil for evil. But you don't know what he did. You don't know what she said. You don't know. It doesn't. What does that verse say? It doesn't matter who it is. Repay no one evil for evil. If they did evil to me, well, what do I get to repay them with? Overcome evil with good. That's what I get to repay them with. It's what God calls upon me as a Christian is to give my life over to a service of love unto others. Do you know the Bible that Jesus said, Jesus said that there would be people who would hate us. Did you know that? In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 44, Jesus said, there's, there's going to be people who hate you. What did he say to do to those people? Did he say to hate them back? He say, make up a list of things that they've done and just keep it with you until a, timely, until a, time, a time comes and you can bring it out. Jesus said, you have heard that it hath been said, Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. You have heard that it hath been said, do what? Love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. Jesus says, that's not what I say to you. I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who persecute you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. The answer to hate is love, not more hate. There is no place in the Christian life for hate. We're, I, I don't want to deal with Titus 3 right now, but I'm going to leave it up to the junior high to not let me forget Titus 3. Okay? I put this too early in my slides and I've changed my mind. Before I get to point three, I'm going to come back to Titus three. So what that means is if I go to point three and I haven't dealt with Titus three, you all raise your hands. All right, you all, you all just do one of these. If I forget, I might forget, but I want to come back to Titus three at the end of this point. Okay, so Simon, you're, you're responsible. If you all forget, it's your fault. Okay, so, but there's no room in a Christian's life for being hateful. There's, there's just no, no place for it. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to look at the cross of Jesus. And the Bible says that he was reviled. He was insulted. He was hated. How did he respond? He did not revile in return. I like John 13 and verse 1. It says he loved them to the very end. It's talking about his disciples. But it says he loved them to the very end. No matter what they would do, Jesus loved them. For just a minute, I want you to think about this matter of love. What does that mean? Jesus had an unflinching, hate-resisting love. What does that mean? What's involved with that? You know, the Greek word agape. Greek word agape was in existence in the Greek language before Jesus came. It was in existence in the Greek language before the church came along. But... It was not really talked about and for sure not perfected until Christ. And so sometimes agape was called the Christian love because Jesus took that word and he said, I'm going to make it mine. You know what agape love is? That, that Greek word for love is agape. You know what that word is? It is a word that means a love that is unconditional. 
conditional. What does is, what is unconditional mean? Well, Romans, cha- Romans chapter 5, you saw it in verse 8. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. God demonstrates His own love towards us. And that while we were what? Yet sinners. What did Christ do? Died for us. What is that kind of love? It's unconditional love. Who did He die for? He died for people who were sinners. And that, but that verse says God's demonstrating His love to us. What does that mean? It doesn't matter who you are and it doesn't matter what you do. I'm going to have this love for you. I've already predetermined how I'm going to respond to you. I've already predetermined how I'm going to treat you. How can I do that? Because I look at Jesus. And that's what Jesus did. He predetermined how He was going to respond. Not based upon any condition that they would do, that that, that they would meet. But His love was going to be extended. It is an unconditional love. It is an unselfish love. Love. What does that mean? I think one of the best Bible definitions of love is in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. It doesn't have the word love in it, but I think it's one of the best Bible definitions of the Greek word agape. What, what, what is agape love? Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. How much can I do out of selfish ambition? Nothing. Here's a love that is unselfish. It is a love that esteems others better than myself. It is a love that's not looking for anything to come out of it. I don't love because of what I can get back. That's that's not agape love. I, I, I I don't do unto someone else in order that they might do unto me in return. That's not agape love. Agape love is unselfish. It looks towards the interest of others in Philippians 2 and verse 4. I look towards the interest of others and not my own interest only. What is it that this person needs? And I want to meet that. Not because I'm going to get anything out of it. Does your marriage need love that's unconditional? Does your marriage need love that's unselfish? Does our society need this? Does our society need us to respond with agape love that is unconditional, unselfish? And the third part of agape love is it is unwavering in its pursuit to meet the other person's needs and interests. It's unwavering in its pursuit to do the very best for the other person. Not for me, but for the other person. That's what Philippians 2 says. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. That's the unselfish part of it. But in lowliness of mind, Let each esteem others, you know what the next word is? Better than himself. You're better than me. I don't care who you are. You're better than me. That's the way a Christian is supposed to respond. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter how you treat me. You are, I am to esteem you better than myself. I need to want what is the very best for you in this life, but more importantly, in the next life. Our world is filled with hatred. You know what the answer to hatred is? It's agape love. That I see at Jesus' cross that was unflinching. If Jesus' love was conditional, would He have died for a bunch of sinners? No. If Jesus' love was selfish, Would he be hanging on a cross when he's the Son of God and could save himself? No. If Jesus' love was not looking out for what was best for everybody else, would he be hanging there for you and me? He would not. Unflinching unselfish, unconditional, hate-resisting love is something that I practice towards everybody. I practice towards people who hate me. People who harm me, people who hurt me, people who humiliate me. I'm going to have this kind of love for them because that's the answer to hate. Is to have this sort of response to them where I look at people who are different than me and it doesn't matter if they're different than me. It doesn't matter if they look different than me. It doesn't matter if they talk different than me. It doesn't matter if they they live different. It doesn't matter. 
Brother and sister in Christ, it's time for us to make up our minds that we are going to stop this hate train. We're not getting on board. We're not going to encourage it. We're not going to pay somebody else's fare. We're not going to say, hey, that's funny. That's a good idea. I like, no, we're not going to be a part of this hate train. We're going to get off the train. And we're, let, let, let's be the ones who say, I'm going to practice agape love towards everybody because that's what Jesus did. I am a Christian first. And when I look at the cross, it starts with my own heart being altered. Being altered by His blood. Being altered by His love. And we'll talk about this real quick because I know, I know there's a lot already. But I want you to look at Jesus' perspective on the cross. Jesus, when He's on the cross, had a unique cross-centered, not just a cross-centered, a cross-filtering perspective. What does that mean? Jesus learned to see everything through the eyes of the cross. Jesus learned to see everything through the lens of the cross. True or false? We always see things the same way God sees them. Is that true? No. We always think things the same way God thinks things. Is that true? No. What does Isaiah 55 say in verse 8 and 9? My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, says the Lord. And that wasn't just an affirmation of truth. That was actually a, a, a condemnation of where His people were, that you're not where you need to be. But our thoughts and our ways are not where God's thoughts and ways are. Well, that doesn't mean, well, they can just be anything they need to be. Jesus was human. And he learned to funnel his thoughts and his ways and to look at things through the lens of the cross. We would do well to view life, to view everything that's involved with it, to view our responses to people through the lens of the cross. What does that mean? I look through the camera when somebody does me wrong. I look through the camera when somebody treats me unfairly. And I look through the camera and I see the cross and that changes how I respond. I need to look at people the same way Jesus looked at people. I need to see every person as a soul that needs to be saved. Doesn't matter what color they are. Doesn't matter how they've treated me. Doesn't matter if they're full of hate or not. Jesus saw souls that needed to be saved. John 4 and verse 4, the Bible says, Jesus needed to go through Samaria. No, He didn't. The Jews never went through Samaria. Jesus, you don't need to go through Samaria. Just take the... We, we've already made that route around Samaria. You don't need to go through Samaria. John 4 and verse 4 says, Jesus needed to go... Th no, you don't, Jesus. We don't, we, don't, we don't deal with those people. Why did Jesus need to go through Samaria? Because there were souls who needed to be saved. It didn't matter if the Jews and Samaritans get, didn't get along. It didn't matter if there was racial strife between them. It didn't matter if they were a different color, a different species, different race. It didn't matter if they were a half-breed. That's what they called them. It didn't matter. Jesus said, I'm going through Samaria because I've got to talk to these people. I need to see people as souls who need to be saved. I need to see situations as opportunities. That's the way Jesus saw them. And every one of these verses from the book of John that's on the screen, every one of these verses talk about the people who wanted to kill Jesus. And he knew it. Some of these verses are quotes from Jesus saying, why do you want to kill me? They, he knew that they wanted to kill him. And what did he do? He saw situations that were not the best. But he saw it as an opportunity to make a difference. Do we see that? Do we see things going on around us? Do we see them as an opportunity? What am I first? I'm a Christian first. Do I see it as an opportunity to say, you know what? Maybe I can say something. Maybe I can do something that will make a difference. I need to see myself the way Jesus sees me. What is it about myself? I don't belong to me. I am not my own. These verses in the book of John, all of them about Jesus in the book of John, these verses where Jesus say that, that I have come to do the will of my Father. I haven't come to do my own will. It's not about me. Even Jesus on this earth said, it's not about my will, it's about His will. 
I need to see myself that way. I need to see myself as not belonging to me. 1 Corinthians 6. You all let me forget Titus chapter... Were you all waving your hands? You let me forget Titus chapter 3. Simon, you're responsible. It's your fault. I forgot Titus chapter 3. And I just remember... And you still, you weren't waving your hands. Y'all are fired. Okay, so I need to learn to see self, me. Someone, I don't belong to myself. 1 Corinthians 6. I've been bought at a price. Brother and sister in Christ, we don't belong. I, I don't get to make up my own rules. I don't get to live the way that I want to live. I don't belong to myself. And if I will learn to see, that's viewing me through the cross. Where was I bought? I was bought by Jesus on the cross. And when I see him buying me, guess what? I don't own me anymore. He owns me. And that's going to determine. That's going to determine how I live. That's going to determine how I respond to others. That's going to determine how I see others. And hopefully that's going to determine how others see me. Is the cross of Jesus the most important thing to you? Is there anything more important? Is there anything more important to you than the cross of Jesus? If that's true, other people ought to see it. They ought to know of your devotion to the Lord, to His church, to His word, to His cross. They ought to see that, and they ought to see that first. They ought to know that first before they know what your political views are before they know what your race is, before they ever look at you. Have you ever talked to somebody on the phone and you didn't know what they look like? And it didn't even matter. Then you met them in prayer. Oh, boy, you don't even look like the person. Did it matter? What does it matter? Somebody needs to know me by my love for the Lord and my crossed, filtered perspective on life before anything else. See, we come to the cross and it changes us. I find doctrinal truths there but I find heart-altering truths there also. We live in a world that is messed up. The only thing that's going to change it is the cross of Jesus. And it's going to start with a heart change, not just in the world. It starts with a heart change right here. When I make the heart alterations I need to make, hopefully others will see it in me and make the same changes in their own life. I look at Jesus, I look at His cross, and I see His universal salvation. It is offered to every single one of us, except that salvation is conditional. Jesus died for every person on earth, but there are things that we must do in order for that blood to save us. We must believe that Jesus is God's Son, that He died on the cross, that He was buried, that He was raised again the third day. And having believed that, having that faith in our heart, we'd say, I, I, He died for me. I don't want to live for self anymore. He died for me. I want to give my life to Him. I want to stop doing wrong, start doing right. The Bible calls that repentance. Make up my mind. That's the direction I want to go. Change the direction of my life. If you're ready to do that today, if you're ready to make up your mind today to give your life to the Lord, you can do what they did in Bible times. Confess the faith that's in your heart and be baptized. Be baptized into Christ. Buried with Christ into His death and allow His blood that was shed in His death to wash away your sins. Let God write your name in heaven. Is your name in heaven? Your name can get written there today. And then God calls upon us to live faithfully to Him. Doing the will of the Father. Jesus said, Jesus said, why are you calling me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I say? Luke 6 and verse 46. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. But those who do the will of God. Being religious isn't enough. I've got to do what God says. If we can help you to get your life right with the Lord, if you need to be baptized this morning for the forgiveness of sins, or to get your life right with Him and walking with Him as a Christian, why don't you come right now as together we stand and sing.